Colin Watson with us. He will give a talk about our WhatsApp sensor project. Uh, it's about um, detecting and defending the bad guy before he's doing bad things within your application. And yeah, uh, it's a quite old project, like five years, I guess, since the first release. And uh, yeah, it's rebooting right now. And yeah, thanks for being with us, Colin. Thank you very much. Um, one, one sec, you might want to clap and give him a warm welcome. <laughs> thanks. 25 minutes passed very quickly. I, think. Um, I have to apologise on behalf of Dennis Groves, who was meant to co-present with me today. Uh, Dennis, together with uh, John Melton and the project founder, uh, Michael Coates and myself, are the co-project leaders. Um, uh, Dennis had to, was moved back to the United States and was unable to, tra to travel here. Um, what I'd first like to do is just talk about what is the general um, universal security strategy. Um, and how that sets the scene for what AppSensor can actually help with. Um, obviously what you want to try to do is to prevent the bad guys from getting you, but given that that's never going to be completely possible, um, you have to think about what you can do after that. Um, so really you want to be able to do detect attackers and react to them potentially before they can actually uh, complete their compromise and perhaps uh, run an exploit attack other systems, export data, da uh, damage data, and so on. Um, but given that that's not going to be completely possible as well, you want to be able to detect whether you've been compromised. And even once you've been compromised, you want ways of um, uh, doing incident response and cleaning up. <coughs> so given that there are going to be some, some, some risks uh, to you just in, because you're running applications, um, what are the traditional risk treatments? Okay, so we can tolerate the risk, we could just accept it, in other words, do nothing about, uh, about it. And in some situations, that's a, a valid approach, given doing some sort of risk assessment. Um, you could transfer the risk, outsource it to someone else. Uh, a couple of approaches to that might be um, contractually. So for example, um, PCI DSS is all about transferring risk liability from acquiring banks to uh, merchants and service providers. Uh, the other um, traditional thought about out outsourcing risk is perhaps insurance. There is an uh, uh, increasing but perhaps immature market in what might be called cyber risk insurance, uh, though there's lots of different names given to it. Um, uh, a better uh, treatment is potentially get rid of the asset completely, and you know, obviously that's not always possible. But there are some intermediate measures, so things like, for example, not collecting data uh, that you don't need and therefore don't need to protect is one uh, type of approach for this, and also disposing of data sooner, um, so having uh, data retention and disposal uh, processes. Uh, losing a million credit cards might be bad, but losing 10 million is even worse, so uh, m m minimizing data is, is, is definitely a way to um, uh, uh, reduce risk. Uh, and the final uh, treatment is to reduce the risk, which is the, um, which is the most commonly, commonly used approach. And remember, risks are a combination of probability and impact. So the likelihood of, a, uh, uh, of an adverse event occurring, and also the magnitude of the effect of, of that event. So we've got possibilities of reducing either probability or impact to reduce the risk. Um, so a common strategy might be to uh, try to reduce the probability of a threat or reduce the probability of vulnerabilities of, uh, occurring. So in terms of what we're talking about here the last couple of days, vulnerabilities in software. Um, another approach, of course, is to reduce the impact of the event. So given that there, there are threats, there might be vulnerabilities or there may be new vulnerabilities that appear in the future in, in your software, um, how might you also reduce the impact of the event? So talking about the OWASP app sensor project, um, what we are primarily focusing on is uh, 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 this, this one down the, down the bottom. So given that there may be attackers uh, uh, looking at your software and trying to enumerate it and look for vulnerabilities, how can we actually stop that progressing into a, a compromise? So people might say, well, how about you know conventional uh, uh, defensive mechanisms, and some are listed on here. 
The difficulty with all of these is that they don't really understand the application context. Um, so um, if you think about something like, um, how about an attacker stepping backwards through a multi-part uh, web form system? It's quite unlikely any of those are going to be able to detect that, okay? Um, or perhaps, how about if a, an authenticated user has access to uh, one document, say document A, but not document B today, but then tomorrow perhaps one, the document B is declassified or the user's privileges are changed, so tomorrow they can access both document A and document B. Okay. None of these things here are likely to be able to detect that whether an attacker was trying to target that difference in privileges at the time, but your application does know this information. Um, the other difficulty with some of these things is that they don't often, uh, they don't always all off cater for things like code running on end user devices or perhaps uh, remote web browsers or uh, mobile devices uh, w w with, with consumers. Now, if I, you know, in my sort of software applications environments, I would want all these things, you know, I want all of these things, but I actually want more, more than this because they, they can't look into what's happening inside the application. So app sensor is a, you can think of it as a sort of type of intrusion detection and prevention system. Um, you're probably mostly familiar with uh, network-based and host-based uh, systems. Host-based systems sometimes include some sort of file integrity monitoring as well. Um, but in terms of doing it at the application layer, this is OWASP app sensor, okay? Um, there's not really anything other than all WASP app sensor out there that talks about this and give, gives you ideas and guidance and planning, suggested coding uh, and uh, methods of implementation. So I'd just like to run through uh, some of the benefits potentially of using something like app sensor, and then I'll uh, talk about how you can uh, consider including such systems in, 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 in your own uh, software. Okay. So the benefit of doing intrusion detection within the application is the application knows a lot about your users. It knows uh, if they're authenticated, it knows who they are, what they've got uh, access to, what they're allowed to do, what user groups they're in, and it also, uh, in the code of your application, you obviously know all the business logic, what, how, how, the, how the application is meant to be being used. So potentially an application can undertake uh, fast inspection of uh, clearly uh, abnormal, malicious user behavior, and then pro provide potentially user-specific responses. And because it knows all this information about the users, the, uh, it has a very high degree of confidence in its threshold for this, confirming that this person really is an attacker and not a normal user. Whereas some other intrusion detection systems are sort of relying on signatures for attacks or perhaps try to guess whether there's odd activity going on. Well, within the application, we just need to look for the very clearly blatant malicious activity and focus on that aspect of it. So, um, you know, when, um, um, if someone runs a scanner or some sort of tool against a, a, an application, it tends to throw in lots of, uh, lots of interactions, so maybe lots of requests on a web, web, against a website or a web service. And it will also probably start to do a lot of fuzzing. So you're getting hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of requests and lots of strange inputs, all the sorts of things that it's not, not possible for a normal user to do in their normal usage of an application. Uh, and the concept of App Sensor is that you put in a number of detection points and the selection of the de detection points is the, is the critical part here, which almost act like little tripwires. So, you know, things like um, shoot an integer, uh, it, 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 an integer field, the user's not meant to be able to modify it unless they're using a tool or have bypassed the, uh, the user interface in some way. If that comes in as something other than an integer, you know something really weird's going on, okay? And these are the types of things that uh, tools and uh, pen testers will do to try to find vulnerabilities. So all you need to do is to have a set of very low threshold Okay. So if it takes an attacker, I don't know, 100, 100 requests to, to find a vulnerability, if we're being generous, okay, maybe let's say 50, okay? Well, if you put some threshold where it says, okay, uh, 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 authentic, uh, sorry, uh, authorization failure detected here, 
um, whitelist input validation failure detected there, oh we've had another whitelist val and it's all from this user. You immediately know and you could say after you know three or four of those things that we've clearly got a problem with this user and we ought to do something. And the applications certainly got some ability itself as well to do some responses. You've probably got things built into your application to things like lock accounts, log users out, but an application could be modified to an extent to allow it to do things like uh, add time delays, modify functionality, disable functions, potentially uh, disable the application in, 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 a, in, a, in, a, in a very extreme event. So there's a lot of potential capability that um, uh, the software architects and developers could, could imagine that could be built into an application to make it self-defending. So the key thing about App Sensor is it, it needs to have a number of detection points around the place and have some central analysis. So you're not relying on a, um, say on authentication, you might have multiple usernames or something and then you block an account, but that's a very localized response in one area of the, the application. The idea is to draw information like that and from other detection points around the application and pull it together centrally so that you can analyze all those uh, uh, malicious usage from various points of the application to draw a conclusion. So the important thing again is you don't need to detect all malicious use, you just need to uh, have detection points that monitor enough for you to work out the intent of a, of a user. So uh, for example at lunch today um, when the, uh, the staff were laying out the food there were lots of people getting their plates and trying to go up and start and the, the staff were getting a bit agitated because you know it wasn't 12.50. Um, so they were only looking for people who were, who were lifting up the, uh, the, the covers on the food and stuff and they, they, they knew at that point, you, you hadn't stolen the food at that point but they knew, they knew what you were trying to do okay so you, you, it, you didn't have to execute the SQL injection you just needed to know that someone was fuzzing around with some parameters okay so that's, that's, that's the approach. So we end up with some quite interesting properties of this um, the, um, you, if you instrument your application in the sort of app sensor way, you can use that just to know whether your applications are under attack, okay? which is interesting because generally uh, people are guessing, they're trying to draw information from these network and host devices as to whether there are attacks going on. But actually the application can tell you definitely, yes, there's something odd going on. Um, and because we're only interested and we only want to add detection points that collect clearly malicious behavior, generally they shouldn't be being activated. So you don't have huge amounts of data to collect and store and analyze. Um, and as I mentioned, you've got this ability potentially for the application to respond in real time. It could do it itself or it could signal other devices, network devices, web application firewalls and so on to respond on its behalf. Um, and those responses could be targeted at an individual user or a group of users, all users, something like that, depending on what the events are. Um, it's also less susceptible to some sort of clever evasion techniques because the data, incoming data is already um, canonicalized and it's, de it's de decrypted, it's available to the application. So you've already, uh, some of these sneaking past filters and uh, intrusion detection systems on the network and things to, to have clever payloads and so on, you can sort of sidestep that because you're looking at the data the application's about to use. Um, and because we're not relying on signatures, all we're looking for is the types of things that attackers do. We're not targeting particular attacks. We're not saying the attacker uh, ended at this point on the site with this particular parameter, with this particular value. So it's not an antivirus type. We don't have to have loads of signatures. We just go, okay, we're worried about people approaching the, the table for lunch and look like they're about to eat something. Okay, it's that sort, that, it's that sort of approach. Um, and it's not just um, people in, uh, in, the, in all WASPs and the AppSense of Project who think this. Uh, it's been very kind that the US Department of Homeland Security has mentioned AppSense are on its page about resilient software, uh, along with the uh, rugged software approach. So those two things are mentioned on the resilient software. The, I've got the URL at the end, so you can, you can read that later. But what we have been working on recently is updating the, the guidebook um, the original project was done in 2008 and there's version 1.1 guidebook which you can download and buy but there's been a lot of work done, additional code samples, uh, we've done a lot of work on documentation, um, implementation processes, we've done training courses here and there about how, how to do this. 
So what we've tried to do is to pull all this together into one new guidebook. And um, we were maybe hoping it was going to be ready for today, but not quite. Um, and um, but So it's currently in review at the moment, so we're 1.35 or something, but it'll probably only get to about 1.4 and then we'll publish it. Um, but again, at the end of this, I've uh, we've got the, the file is uploaded on, on the wiki, it's just not linked from anywhere. So you'll be able to download this after the talk and you can have a good rake through it if you want to read more information. Um, but once the, the book's published, we'll, uh, uh, um, we'll send out a message on, 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 on the mailing list. Um, so in there we've got um, an overview, illustrative case studies, how you make it happen, what processes do you need to go through, what things to think about, uh, demonstration and implementations. Um, so in the case studies, for example, we've tried to select a range of different types of applications that people might be interested in and then um, discuss what the business issues are, what, 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 what the objectives, and then discuss what, the, um, what type of thought might go into detection points, what thresholds for attack detection, and what responses might be suitable. And we try to avoid just focusing on web applications. So there's uh, web services, uh, trading systems, desktop systems, and for example, things you know like uh, just smart grid consumer meters, just to just to think of al alternative ideas. So on the smart grid meter, for example, you could have detection points, which are like, is someone trying to tamper with the device? So did someone connect to the optical port? Uh, has a new flash image been downloaded? Has the configuration file been altered? Uh, has the device tried to communicate to uh, some other IP address that's unexpected? That type of thing. And in that case, the, the brains for app sensor would have to be somewhere in the head end systems owned by the energy supplier because you can't trust the device. But you can see how the, the, the detection points can be wi wi within some remote, remote device there. Um, <coughs> For the demonstration implementations, um, this was the original code that's be, that was produced in 2008 and it's been updated uh, uh, um, during 2009, 2010 and 2011. And more recently there's a sort of standalone uh, web services version being, being made as well so that you can potentially hook your application into this standalone web one or if you're uh, writing a Java application you can include this code. But we've also tried to include some other examples of uh, other ways to help people understand how they might implement it. Um, so you can just hook into some existing code, but you might want to consider doing it other ways yourself. And I'm just going to touch the, talk about this one slightly more, uh, but Dennis Cruz wrote some, um, uh, done some demonstration with including um, this jar file in .NET. And we also talk about you could outsource all this brain activity to a log management system or what you can potentially do in a web application firewall. Okay, so on the light, the light touch retrofit, what we wanted to do was just try to demonstrate the sort of thinking process to go through, how you might select detection points and do response actions. I was going to run through it very briefly, because what we decided to do was choose something that was sorry, very run of the mill, not necessarily enterprise, <coughs> uh, but might be a target. Okay, so something run on Windows with IIS, PHP, um, MySQL. Um, and the thought was, how could we um, choose something vulnerable, or well, might be vulnerable, so we chose a bulletin board application, PHPBB, and said, how could we implement AppSensor on that without touching the code, or touching it as little as possible? Now, what we managed to do was think of a way of applying AppSensor to that, which only involves uh, modifying the INI file, and also writing a few scripts, okay? So, um, what we did was we built a number of detection points in, and these basically were in two formats. We uh, uh, modif modified the INI file so that the, it uh, auto-appended a script, and then from that script we wrote a number of detection points, um, some of which mined database tables that the PHP database already includes. So the, the PHP BB database tracks things like failed authentication attempts, and uh, file uploads and posts. So you can look for data like multiple failed authentication attempts. You can look for a high rate of um, um, authentication attempts. You can look for a high number of file uploads. You can look for excessive message posting. So we can, we can use our script, a new script, and we can query database tables here and give us four or five detection points. We also created one or two additional um, uh, scripts, like we created a fake admin directory 
and put a script in there which acts as a detection point. So if anyone goes there, we just record it. Um, we also put a bit of um, um, uh, information in the robots.txt file just to see if anyone uses that. And if they go there, we record it. And we also put a fake php.info file on the site, which has got a detection point in it. So if anyone looks at that, we, we record it. Um, uh, so you can use all those, all those as, as, as the detection points. Um, then as these are processed, we write them to a log. Um, and periodically, we look at that log and we set some thresholds and we say, well, if we get four or five of these things from a single user or IP address, um, we'll determine that's an attack. Um, so we analyze it. And then we thought, well, how, how do we do responses in PHP BB? Well, one of the interesting things is in the database, there's a table where you can actually write usernames and IP addresses to stop them posting messages. So that's one response. Write a record into this table. And the other one was, perhaps at a higher level of uh, activity, we could add an IP address to the Windows firewall. Okay, so we ended up with two response actions. So, so far, we haven't actually touched this code at all, other than the uh, any file. Which obviously, there's, there's, other, there's, more, there's more approaches. So that, that was one way of doing it. Um, but the other thing that we've actually done from this is because, um, because this was quite easy to do, what we thought was, oh, it would have been quite nice to set this up as a honeypot. So we've installed some uh, separate honeypot code on this. And we're running, currently at the moment, two sites in parallel, one with app sensor on it and the honey pot monitoring data, and another one which is just the plain PHP BB with the honey pot. And um, we've stuck them on proper domain names, put them out there with some fake content on them. So I'm not telling the addresses because that will spoil the test. So we're just going to leave it running for a while and see if it makes any difference. Okay. <laughs> um, so we've got that going on. So the project itself, we've got lo lots of contributors, which is very nice. Um, we're about to finish the book off. Um, we might get some funding to do some design on, design on the book. It looks all right, but we might do some professional design. We've got this honeypot trial thing running. Uh, we'll also write up a cheat sheet for the cheat sheet series. We've got some text to drop into the code review guide that's been written at the moment, and the new testing guide that's been done. We, we might contribute some text into the um, uh, business logic section. Uh, so uh, next year we're, we're probably working up the standalone engine a little bit more, so it's it's more uh, it, it's a, it's a little bit it covers more of the detection points, and we also want to start thinking about demonstrating other ways of providing user uh, sorry, information back to operations people from app sensor type attacks, how that might work, how that might might, might look. So I provided. Uh, in the presentation, uh, project, the mailing lists, that's the, D, uh, the Department of Homeland Security page. Uh, there's a glossy article in here, the Crosstalk Journal, about it. Um, we've got inspirational lists of detection points and response actions. That's the old book. This is the new one. You can get it here. So this will be being updated over the next month or two. There's probably a, um, it's probably worth waiting a couple of weeks because I think we've got a chunk of a New, new additional text to go in the introductory section to be added in the next couple of weeks. And then the, the tool I used to modify the PHP BB application to make it a honeypot came from here. Um, so I'll, subsequently I'll probably write up just the process of, um, uh, of, of, of doing that. Um, so we've got uh, about five minutes left, um, so I wanted to leave some time for some questions uh, if people have it. Thanks. Hey, so um, this is a great project. I had a question. I was talking to Michael Coates about it, and uh, maybe I had a misimpression about the quality or the expectations of the actual code behind it. I thought that AppSensor had a library that you could drop in that did all the work of managing all the events and all that, and then obviously you'd have to write custom code to send those events to that library, but he was acting like it's more of a proof of concept rather than something you would actually feel comfortable handing over to someone and say, use this in your app. What are your thoughts on the maturity of that, and is it usable? Are you trying to get there? You don't think it's a good idea, or what? Uh, the, what we called the second item on that list was AppSensor Core is probably like that. You could just use it, but it's probably not that mature enough. 
the web services version is partly uh, partly there, but is is intended to be a much more mature uh, version, and I, th I think that's probably going to be finished this year. Um, it's being worked on at the moment, um, but we also want to talk in the book about lots of other ways to do it yourself as well. That's um, because the. the there may be opportunities to make small modifications to your code that, uh, that would be adequate. So for example, if you were doing a good application logging, uh, security event logging already, what you might just be able to do is mine your existing logs. Okay, so you, you sort of sidestep quite a lot of the work. There's one more question. Uh, you were saying that you only uh, modified the init file um, to start doing uh, detection of, of possible attacks in uh, the BB PHP uh, application. So can you go into a little more detail about that? Uh, yes. So how, how how does that trigger? When when is the uh, are these detections triggered? And and, and yeah, okay. So w w we were we were being quite extreme on that, and that we didn't want to, we wanted to try to say, well, can we do this without touching the code at all? Okay. So um, it was shall we say a simplistic implementation so every time there's a request coming into the site it's running through our parallel scripts we could of course optimize that so we've auto prepended a PHP script on the top of all the entry points effectively for PHP BB um, you, you know, at scale you wouldn't just want to do that but this was a quick way to demonstrate not touching the code at all any other questions Colin, you mentioned one very interesting thing, which is integration with web application firewalls. So my question is really, what is the output like and how it can be utilized for, let's say, real-time blocking on a WAF? Uh, okay. Um, there's, there's a couple of use cases for web application firewalls. You could use a WAF to provide some detection points. Okay, so a WAF might detect uh, malformed HTTP requests, for example. Quite good. It could pass that information to your app sensor. Um, but what you're particularly asking about is the other way around, okay? AppSense has decided there, are, there is an attack. How does it communicate to something else to, 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 to add a rule? Um, I suppose it'd be a bit like what we did there with the signaling to the Windows firewall. In the Windows firewall case, we, 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 we called the, on the same host. We inserted a record into the, into the Windows firewall. Uh, but providing you've got some web application firewall that can accept incoming communication, um, and you might actually do it, you could do it at your network firewall, because a lot of network files are right, fine, will block an IP address or something. Um, providing you've got that communication chain and the uh, receiving network device or web application firewall is able to rewrite rules or add rules on the fly, um, then you could uh, modify the, 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 the network firewall or web application firewall as one of your responses. Okay, any more questions? Nope. Then, thanks again. Thank you.